Hello, and welcome to Hear Her Sports, about phenomenal female athletes and women in sports. I'm Elizabeth Emery. Today, we are so lucky to have here New York-based sports writer Eric Ayala to talk about what's going on in women's hockey these days. If you haven't been following along as the Canadian League closed and North American players stand up for better pay and conditions, Erica will bring you up to speed. And if you have been following, she gets into some of the details, possible outcomes, and how we can think about that in relation to what's happening in other women's sports. Erica writes the weekly hockey column for the Title IX newsletter, covers women's basketball for the new WNBA vertical at The Athletic, has contributed women's sports coverage to ESPNW, The Guardian, The Hockey News, Think Progress, WBAI Sports Qualified, and is a ringside reporter for the National Women's Hockey League. This episode is really fun because Erica has insider's perspective and has talked to players recently and over the years. As she says, emotions are hot. Stay tuned for reasons for that and for Erica's vision of a long-term ideal. Welcome, Erica. I'm really so glad that you're here. Yeah, thank you for having me. Very excited to talk uh, NWHL in particular. Yeah, uh, Women's Athletes Uniting and Taking a Stand is one of my favorite topics, and this particular story of women's hockey is, really seems complicated, so thank you for joining me and you know, offering your research and expertise. I really appreciate it. Of course. So could you start just by giving a background of women's hockey to get us to where we are today? I mean, like, what do we need to know about Canadian women's hockey and U.S. women's hockey and maybe NHL and also the conditions in professional women's hockey right now? Sure. So uh, I'll try to keep it short because it is a rather long history. I think myself included, I I kind of got involved with women's professional hockey within the last four years um, through the National Women's Hockey League, the NWHL. But I would point uh, listeners to the Victory Press in particular. I know that they've done a full, a more full, extensive history of women's professional hockey, or I should say women's organized hockey, because professional, and rightfully so, I think, implies that there is payment. But we'll start from about four seasons ago. So in 2015, Danny Ryland, the founder of the National Women's Hockey League, um, she started up a four-team league, the, at the time, New York Riveters, Buffalo Buttes, Connecticut Whale, and the Boston Pride. As the story goes, Danny Ryland wanted to have a New York expansion team of the CWHL, the Canadian Women's Hockey League, which started, if I'm not mistaken, 12 seasons would take us to 2007, I believe. So um, she wanted to have an expansion team there, the Canadian Women's Soccer or Hockey League, excuse me, the CWHL had one team in the United States. It's a North American league. um, And Danny Ryland wanted to expand. That didn't quite happen. She started her own league. So that kind of brings us to what most people know as kind of a little bit of the, um, the landscape, the most recent landscape of women's ice hockey. But again, the victory press has you covered for several years and iterations, including the original NWHL, um, Go check out that history. So Danny Ryland starts the NWHL as we know it, the modern day NWHL. She then expanded, the league expanded to Minnesota. The Minnesota Whitecaps have been involved in women's professional hockey um, kind of as a barnstorming team, but they joined the NWHL last year. The CWHL with a partnership with China and the Chinese Federation actually expanded to China and originally uh, had two teams there. Then it dropped down to one. Now flash forward to March 31st, 2019, the CWHL, which was a nonprofit model worth mentioning. They announced on a Sunday morning at approximately 10 o'clock AM that they were going to close their doors effective May 1st, 2019. May 1st, 2019, the CWHL does indeed close. By May 2nd, we are at hashtag for the game. So that's the abbreviated (laughs) women's hockey history. And I'm sure we'll get into a lot more of of all that that entails. (laughs) Yeah. And I like that you brought up that sort of this word professional hockey. So let's talk about the money part. The salary, because I know that's mm. that's an issue, but it's not the only issue of this this current situation that we're in right now. 
Right. So the NWHL, when it started in 2015, not only was it an an American-based league, but it was an American-based league that was going to, from the beginning, from inception, pay players. At the time, the highest salary, if I'm not mistaken, was about $25,000, $26,000 for the season. Um, Kelly Stack made the highest salary in the first few years. I think what's important and is that that's the salaries didn't stay at that. So um, in 2015, the CWHL was not paying its players. It didn't start paying its players until the expansion with China happened. Um, but the NWHL did start paying the players again. The highest paid player for that first season was at around 25k. By the middle of season two, those salaries were drastically cut. Um, the estimate is definitely um around 50 percent but it it was if you speak to some players it was really closer and upward of 60 percent salary cut wow so now yeah so we enter last season the 2018-19 season with now the cwhl and the nwhl both paying players for an example cwhl player and canadian national team player sarah nurse she made two thousand dollars playing professional hockey in Canada last year. She played for the Toronto Furies. Then you have in the NWHL, the highest paid salaries, I believe, was $7,000, $6,000, $7,000 to play in the National Women's Hockey League. So in the two leagues, in the last two seasons, the salaries bottomed out at $2,000 Canadian. Um, I believe it was 2500 in the NWHL was the lowest salary and tapped out at around $7,000 US. And my understanding is that their playing situation isn't that great either. You know, they don't have great travel schedules or facilities and coaches and trainers. You know, they don't have everything that sort of surrounds a real professional team. Is that correct? Yes. So, uh, again, that word professional. Um, right. If you think about in... I'm more familiar with the NWHL as far as um, being able to speak to things like training and travel. But my understanding is, well, let's just start with the CWHL. What do we know? They expanded to China. So now these teams have to travel to China um, to play their competition. Another thing worth mentioning, which did not sit well with a lot of the CWHL players, was that the CWHL expanded, but then players playing in China that were from North America or not um, essentially Chinese national team players, they were paid as sports ambassadors. And the estimate for their salary was around Hmm. $60,000. Yes. So there was a lot of inequity happening. Then you also throw in um, with the NWHL, for example, Last season, the Buffalo Buttes were said to have been owned by the Pagula Sports Entertainment. They own the the Buffalo Bills, the Sabres. And so there were certain um, additional uh, perks, if you will, that they could offer to really get to that professional level, such as housing and uh, assisting with travel that other teams didn't have. Also, if you look at the Riveters, they had a partnership until recently. We'll get into that (laughs) with the the New Jersey Devils. And they, from my understanding, including the Buffalo team, were the only team that had a locker room in the NWHL that they had access to all year round. And it was only their locker room. There were no junior teams, no rec leagues that used that space. That was just for the Riveters. So you, you see that there are definitely some situations across the board, across both North American leagues, where you had things that were closer to professional, but I think you'd have to give both leagues kind of, if we're being nice, maybe a a C minus D when it comes to (laughs) the level of professionalism for women, uh, for female hockey players, for uh, professional athletes, particularly in 2018-19. I think the standard has raised over the years across the board in sport, but it has not elevated for women's hockey. I think the Buffalo Buttes example is really interesting because everything I read, all the players seemed, you know, just effusive about the situation they were in. And, you know, they certainly weren't making any more money than any of the other team players, but they had 
a professionalism surrounding their playing that seemed to make a huge difference. Yes. Um, and I think, again, you, you saw some of that. There were things, and you mentioned it, that the salaries stayed at the, the NWHL salary rate or salary cap, but there were other things that were available to them. Things like having meals um, after, before and after practice, before and after games, being able to have, they had, you know, their own PR um, and media relations and, and things like that. Um, it is interesting though, because I spoke to a player, she did not play with the Buttes last season, but, um, for, for 2017, 18, the Buttes kind of took ownership of the team midway through, and she wanted to see more from the partnership. Um, and I think you started to really see that come to light. Unfortunately, we, we don't get to see, it, at least for the presumable future, what, what that would have looked like with a little bit more time. Um, but yes, I do think that overall the sentiment was that that was a good partnership um, and it did get the NWHL as a, as a whole and certainly the Butte team much closer to professional than what other teams likely enjoyed in NWHL and then again across women's hockey. Right. You sort of mentioned it, but just to reiterate it, both Pagula pulled out of the Butte and the New Jersey Devils pulled out of the Riveters. So, And That's that just correct. happened within the last week, both of those. Yes, that's correct. So the Pagula, Pagula Sports Entertainment. Um, and this is something that I found a little odd. Uh, Lindsay D'Arcangelo, who's who's in Buffalo and, and covers Buffalo sports for The Athletic, it sounded as though there was no money exchanged for ownership of the Buttes um, and that the Buttes were essentially just taking on the expenses. Um, so I, I just thought that was interesting when we're talking about business models, because I'm sure we'll get into for the game is a lot about business model. That's a lot of the, the language that's being thrown around. So it just was interesting to me that it didn't seem like any money was exchanged. So it was essentially that now everything goes back to the NWHL going now to the New Jersey Devils. They had um, a strategic alliance that would have entered its third season and they cut that short by one season. Now, the interesting thing, as I mentioned with the Riveters is again, they had access to that locker room 365, 24 seven, from what I understand. And now the reports are, and I haven't been able to speak to anyone from the New Jersey devils organization just yet. I'm hoping that I'll, I'll get to speak to someone, but um, we understand from reports by Emily Kaplan and a few others that the devils are not making ice time or the locker room facilities available for the NWHL at all. So the NWHL and the metropolitan riveters, one of the four teams, that has a championship in the NWHL, they're going to have to find a new home. Right. Man, I have just so many questions. I mean, like you talk about, <laughs> <laughs> you talk about they have to find a new home. I mean, some of my question is just like, will something be happening for the next season? The NWHL is moving forward as if that is the case and also in for the game. So when I use the term hashtag for the game, that is, of course, the statement of players that was made on social media stating that they will not play in any North American women's professional league for the upcoming season. So that would be 2019, 2020. So players like Hillary Knight, Kendall Coyne, Schofield, if you look at some Riveters players, Michelle Picard, who was the captain of the Riveters and made her way back to the national team. She has uh, retweeted and has taken to social media to show her support for, for the game. So we don't know. I guess that's my way of saying we really don't know. Uh, the NWHL is moving forward, as I was saying, as though there will be a, a, a next season for them, a season five, as it would be. The CWHL no longer exists, so they're not. there's nothing to plan on that side. But players are resolute in saying they will not play in North America. There have been lots of things suggested and, and hinted at as far as what that will mean. We've also seen players start to use the term gap year. Um, Sarah Nurse did a great interview and Anya Badalino, who's the NWHL Players Association director. She was also on that podcast for Hockey Night in Canada. According to Sarah Nurse, they really want this to be within the time frame of a 16-month absence from the sport and then find their way back. 
Um, but but there's not really ind- any indication of what for the game will look like. There are still a lot of questions about if the NWHL will get going in season five, but then also what would that look like? Um, so there, there's a lot more questions than answers right now. Sure is. So there are 200 players who have signed on to the for the game. So how many players are saying that they're not for that? So that is a, n- a number a little hard to find. I would recommend um, I just there's so many great people. And, and this is why I'm going to completely name drop throughout this conversation, because there's a lot of really great people that I've worked with closely that cover both of these leagues, uh, particularly those I know in the NWHL that I do think uh, folks should follow if they want a little more context. So Melissa Burgess, I know, is one person that has a list of players in the NWHL who have those who have signed on to for the game those who maybe just aren't active on social media and those who at least as of yet or publicly haven't said anything um so those lists do exist the majority from going off of melissa's list last time i looked at it it does look like the majority of players that played in the nwhl last year have publicly endorsed for the game however I have spoken to players um, that have wished to remain anonymous and they are in a situation where they want to remain anonymous, not because they're necessarily against the idea and the concept of for the game, but they have questions about for the game, what it means. They also have questions for the NWHL and wanted time to be able to sift through the information as it was coming. And these players felt that even having those conversations with their former teammates, I mean, college teammates, professional teammates, uh, competition on the ice and friends, that even saying that has kind of um, been difficult. And there are a lot of emotions, I think, any way you slice it, And rightfully so. Uh, There's a lot of emotion. There's a lot of frustration. There's a lot of question right now. So the numbers, we don't really know. I think that will start to come into focus now that the NWHL has officially opened their free agent period so players can start to sign. Um, And then we'll see. There are reports that there are roughly 15 to 17 players within the first few days of free agency that have had conversations with GMs of the five teams. Uh, my friend Mike Murphy, a uh, former co-host of the of a podcast we did on women's hockey, he, he reported that. I, again, I've also spoken to players who have said that they've already signed. Um, so we're just kind of waiting to see, again, publicly what will come to light. Are you able to articulate or hypothesize, I don't know what it is actually, of what the two sides are and what each side wants or is hoping to have, you know, both for this coming season, but also in the bigger picture long term? Yeah, so and it's a little um, what I'll start here because I think this gets lost. I will start by saying every single player that I've spoken to wants women's hockey to be better than it was last season and to be better than it was four years ago, to be better than it was 12 years ago. So four years ago is when we got the NWHL. 12 years ago is when the CWHL started. There is not one single player who I have spoken to who does not want the game to get better. I think where the difference of opinion is, is if removing services from the only existing league is the best way to do that. So you have players like Kimberly Sass played for the Metropolitan Riveters for the past two seasons, also as a founding member of the Buffalo Buttes. She is uh, on the side of for the game. She has no intention of signing a contract um, as of what she said in interviews and publicly on social media with the NWHL because of some of the things that she's had to go through. Um, and she wants to make sure that things like as a goalie, she's a goalie, when she has to pay for equipment that she's not paying out of pocket more money than she's actually making from the league. That was the, uh, a point of contention for her. If you talk to Hillary Knight, she is not confident in the NWHL business model. She was one of those players that took a pay cut in season two and 
she wants to see things like, um, you know, making sure insurance is taken care of, making sure that travel, as you mentioned, is taken care of. Um, and I think that is coming. Some of that is coming from her experience, her lived experience in season two, which is fair. Now I want to go to people on the, um, that have a little bit of a difference of opinion, people like Madison Packer, who's um, publicly spoken that she plans to return to the NWHL. Madison Packer is a player that I spoke to after the cuts that I spoke to when the national team was going through their be bold for change movement right before the 2017 women's worlds. And her comment was, I just thought it was ironic at the time that the NWHL would support the national team and their uh, pay equity battle in the same season that they cut NWHL salaries. So suffice to say that Madison Packer can be 100% upfront with what's happening in women's hockey. But in this particular circumstance, and after the comments that I just made mention of that she made in 2017, Packer stuck with the league. And I asked her flat out about that. You know, where where are you coming from with this, Packer? I know that you've been critical of things. And she's like, Eric, I absolutely have been. But I still see progress. And that means something to me. And I want to see out what this can be. Because in her perspective, even though she's critical, every year things have gotten better. Then you talk to, I mentioned Anya, the NWHL PA director. She's coming from the point as um, where some of these calls for, for the game she wasn't involved in. And her stance has been, had I been able to bring anything more to the table in negotiations, I would have done that, but I wasn't given the opportunity to do that. So again, from my perspective in watching women's hockey, the arguments on both sides make a lot of sense and both are rooted in making women's hockey better. I just think that there is a level of patience perhaps, or, or wanting to kind of see every option on the table versus being and I, I would say rightfully so fed up with um, some of the things that women's hockey players have had to endure and not wanting to do that anymore and just kind of drawing a line in the sand. And while I personally still have a lot of questions, I 100 percent understand the perspective of everyone that I've spoken to Um but I still do have questions for, for all of them on their particular perspective because everything's still very cloudy right now. Oh, it's definitely very cloudy. But one thing that I think about is that there's definitely an issue for a lot of the players that taking a gap year may mean taking an end to their, their career. Yes. You know, they're at yes. the point where this, this is it. And I think that's a hard, I mean, and a lot of the players have said, okay, I'm willing to do that. But I, I suspect that there are players who are not for, for the game, who are not willing to make that sacrifice. I would suspect so as well, because absolutely right. Whether it is the 16 month period, which right now, if I'm being honest, is hard to imagine that we're going to get anywhere, even if, even if the NWHL closed tomorrow, my, I strongly suspect that for the game, just as it's not a boycott, just as it's not um, at least publicly stating that it wants to close the NWHL, those are the results, right? Those are the, that's what's happening. For the game is is definitely putting the NWHL in a very difficult position to, to operate. And so similarly to how at least the, the for the game is saying that that's not their intent, that is what what could very well happen. And so if the NWHL closes tomorrow, I think the other intent that I don't think is being explicitly mentioned is that for the game wants the NHL, the National Hockey League to get involved. And so even if the NWHL closed t tomorrow, the CWHL is already out of the way. I don't get a good sense that there is a definitive timeline that even fits within 16 months, within two, three years of the National Hockey League getting involved. And so without those questions being answered, absolutely, someone who is like a Kimberly Sass um, or even maybe to some extent Madison Packer, these are players that are not in the national team system. They are not getting stipends from Hockey Canada or USA Hockey even if Madison Packer was hashtag for the game, if she sits out next year, 
and then that becomes two years, and then that becomes three years. Same thing with Kimberly Sass. Are they going to be in a position where they can pick up hockey again? Is it going to be economically, does that make sense for them to go back to playing hockey if hockey salaries are still not livable wages? Right. I don't know. I, I think probably not. But the thing is that there are players coming out of college every year. Um, so, you know, perhaps there is enough. But I think there is a concern, not just for the individual, but one player that I spoke to that, that didn't want to attach her name. Her concern was it's been hard to get people in the 12 years that the CWHL existed to watch the CWHL in the four years that the NWHL existed to watch the NWHL in the Olympic years for, for people to follow the women's tournament. But then again, every year for women's worlds or for four nations in the last several years, there's been streams. There's been games on TSN women's hockey professional games if that's off the table now are we just going to expect that once we pick everything back up all of that comes back when it took us that long to even get that kind of exposure she doesn't know and i think that's valid um because part of the argument if you look at the usa hockey and and their boycott that i mentioned be bold for change u.s soccer who is one of the most successful national teams in the United States. Look at what they're asking for, the WNBA. These are all women in sport asking for marketing dollars, exposure, proper and, and equitable treatment when it comes to things like per diem and travel. This is 2019, and these are what these national teams are asking for. I think there's a lot of question that if we step away from the game and if we take ourselves away from North American professional hockey, what is to say that anyone is going to want to pick that back up when it's taken them so long to even acknowledge that women's hockey exists? I agree. But at the same time, you know, like being satisfied with crumbs is sometimes so demeaning. Yes. And that's the other part of it. And I and that's why I am conflicted by, again, just what I feel to be. Uh, uh, we're in this really cloudy point right here, I think. And, and that is absolutely valid because there is something to players saying, you know, what you were giving is not enough and it never was enough. And that is absolutely valid. As someone who sees what players go through, there are a lot of things that need to change for women's hockey. And um, again, if you go back to what the WNBA has done and what they've talked about, but particularly U.S. soccer, uh, there's, a, there's a similar situation where or even Billie Jean King, you know, the, what was it? The Virginia Slims tournament. Absolutely. And that was something that she created bec to, to want for multiple reasons. One, because, um, you know, the, the sanctioned tennis federation at the time was not giving equitable pay to women and had no interest and no desire to put resources into women's tennis. So women for women by women had to show that there was interest and that's how Virginia Slims came around. Very similar to now, if you listen to the 99ers from U.S. soccer, they're talking a lot. They're kind of doing a media tour. And the victory tour that we see now came because the 99ers, U.S. soccer didn't believe they had just put all this money, millions of dollars into MLS and didn't want to do didn't want to put money into women's professional soccer. So the national team players themselves decided to kind of create this tour, this 10 game tour and showcase women's soccer and show that there was a fan base that would follow them outside of sanctioned international tournaments. So there's a lot of context for what's happening. Again, not being able to pay bills, not having things like one of the players that hasn't signed on for, for the game, but one of the things that she said she did want to see for the future of women's hockey is right now in the NWHL, they do have health coverage, but the, the thing she wanted to see and the thing that she's hoping is in the new contracts is that these players are getting 
um, the maintenance of their bodies covered. So right now, if you wanted to buy particular gear or a particular mouthpiece or a particular piece of equipment that helps you recover quickly, there's no mechanism with which you can do that in women's professional hockey. And that's something, for example, that she wants to see um, really come from this. And that's exactly to your point and to the point, honestly, of the 200 plus players. That's exactly why they're saying we will not sign on. We will not play hockey in North America. I'm glad you brought up Billie Jean King because people forget what a fight that was and exactly. how she put herself on the line and how those other women put themselves on the line and how there was also division within women's tennis about who would sign and who would not sign. Exactly. It was ugly. Um, you know, same thing with, I mentioned U.S. soccer and, you know, one of the most famous scabs in all of, you know, sport <laughs> is Brandy Chastain. Uh, who won then the the World Cup, the 99 World Cup with that penalty kick, you know, so so it's just it's very complicated is really what I'm trying to say. I'm extremely personally, professionally um, conflicted with how I see things from day to day and really from person to person and player to player. Um, and I, I, I think you're absolutely right that that is also a part of the history of these types of things, and not just in women's sports, this happens in, in men's sports as well. Um, but now the the real work is going to be, so what happens now? I think that we still are in a phase where there, again, are a lot of emotions. People are maybe feeling a certain way that they weren't on calls or feeling a certain way that, um, you know, s someone is not tweeting for the game or is asking certain questions or has even said they'd sign an NWHL contract. Maybe people are upset because they said they wouldn't play in North America, but maybe they'll go play in Sweden or Switzerland. But there's only so many spots that will be available to players, particularly in the CWHL. You know, they had six I think it was six teams. Yeah, that that now you you have six teams worth of players that have nowhere to play. Are they going to look to play in in Europe? What does that mean for the players from North America that are there now? Are they going to be displaced? Uh, so there's lots of questions. There's just lots of questions. And I think the best thing that could happen is a little bit of a reset. I think that the goals but particularly the expectation of the NHL for me is very unclear right now. And I think it's worth the players really making sure that they are able to express what taking a gap year, um, not necessarily what it means, but what it will lead to and who are they talking to and what are the buttons that they're pushing and pressing. If you look at Billie Jean King, Virginia Slims, their target was clear. U.S. soccer and their current lawsuit is very clear. It's it's you, the U.S. Soccer Federation. I'm not sure there's a clear target here right now, either a target of, well, it's not explicit, uh, the target. I think the target is the NWHL because that's the only North American women's professional league. But I also think the target is the NHL for two very different reasons. But I think some of that really has to be explicit. And if, if um, the NHL isn't going to step in or if the players aren't asking or trying to force the hand of the NHL, then who are they talking to to make sure that this gap year, this 16-month kind of figure-it-out period – Who's going to help and who's going to be at the head of bringing women's ice hockey back? We don't know right now. You know, I'm really good at coming up with all these conspiracy theories. And I got to tell you, <laughs> it sort of looks to me from the outside that there is some, you know, backroom discussions going on about yes. how to break everything down. And then the NHL will come in and develop something that they want to develop. Yeah, I... Um think that is definitely a part of this larger women's hockey conversation. And it's really not something that I think should be surprising to people. I mean, when Brenda Andres was the commissioner for the CWHL, 
Cassie Campbell Pascal has talked about she's seen plans for an NHL or I should say an, a WNHL and it just is there there's leaders that are in the way uh, again the, this these conversations have been happening for a while and it does seem that there are some people that are more in the loop than others and that happens also in labor movements. That's also not surprising. So I'm not I, I, I don't see anything intrinsically wrong with that, except if the message isn't clear and there are still a lot of people that have questions and they feel that when they've been trying to ask these questions, that that has been what's kind of put them on the outskirts, that to me, just seems to be an unnecessary lack of communication. Right, right, right. I mean, one of the reasons I said my conspiracy theory thing is that some of the excuses being used for these breakdowns that are happening seem like a bunch of hooey, honestly. I mean, and you t- yeah. you mentioned the business model mm. issues, <laughs> and I, it, it just doesn't make sense to me. Could you sort of talk about oh, the nonprofit man. and the for-profit and I'm all of that business? really glad you asked that because this has really... Uh, to to use a Southern term, burned my grits since coming into and learning about women's hockey. And this, and I, I am a professional in the nonprofit sector. I'm a professional advocate in the nonprofit sector, and I'm very much so involved in, uh, you know, community led social movements. So all of this like should be like right up my alley, but there are just so many things, including this insistence that a nonprofit business model can't work. I, I, I've never been comfortable with that. What I do think is fair when we're talking about the CWHL and the NWHL is not necessarily the business model because people say business model, but one, I don't know if one has ever existed. And two, like it, even those who are criticizing the business model have never really broken down what about the business model they don't like. So that kind of, to me, just seems like a buzzword with no context. Right. Um, what I will say is going back to, I believe it was called the WUSA and um, ESPN 30 for 30 has a great podcast on this right now. The WUSA in women's soccer, it was the national team players. They found people that were that believed in what they were doing. They liked that they were on strike against the soccer federation. And they were like, we see an opportunity. We're going to put millions of dollars into the women's the first ever women's professional soccer league in the United States. Millions of dollars. And if you listen to this podcast The issue was not with the business model. That's not why they ran out of money. The issue was with the leadership and the leadership not following the business model in that case. I don't know if that's the case with the CWHL or the NWHL, but what I have, what I think, and this is where I do agree with Cassie Campbell Pascal, is that there is some rub with the leadership, not necessarily under Jaina Hefford, she didn't have much time, so I don't want to put the weight of this on her, but with Brenda and Danny Ryland, there's been lots of conversations, and they have not always been the most pleasant about, um, they're just kind of being, um, you know, this 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 competition and, and, you know, a foul taste left after Danny Ryland started the NWHL, but I don't even think that that's the most salient point. Again, I think the point is, is that is the leadership that exists in women's hockey, are they doing everything that they can to make sure they're executing the business model that they have to the best of their abilities? And I think those are valid questions to ask. And by putting things together and connecting the dots from what players say about their experience in one league or the other, the answer presumably is no. And what I don't do you mean think by that. that. So I, I'm I'm talking about when you have players in the CWHL who Hillary Knight, one of them, when she played in the CWHL before she was with Montreal. Th- there's this infamous cartoon that she kind of put together about having to, you know, sell tickets to Boston Blades games, you know, and players feeling that they had to get. Fans. And again, that's that's nothing new to women's hockey. But if from if I'm remembering the history correctly, um, you know, if the players didn't sell those tickets, they were expected to eat that expense and essentially pay 
for the tickets that they weren't able to sell. Right. Um, that's not really the greatest, um, you know, execution of leadership, um, in my opinion, because your players should be getting ready for their games by preparing their bodies, not necessarily by having to sell tickets. And it sounds certainly, like Girl Scouts selling cookies or something. Exactly. And certainly not in a professional hockey setting. I mean, I, I'm not, I can't speak to this uh, with any clear certainty with 100%, but I'm a Mets fan. I don't think that there's been a Mets fan in the last at, at least 60 years, maybe early in the MLB, that ever was told, you have to sell these tickets to the Mets games. And the Mets don't always have the greatest attendance, okay? I know, because I'm a fan. You know, if you don't sell these tickets, you have to pay us the value of the tickets that you don't sell. I don't know any men's professional uh, athlete who would be asked to do that. Yet in women's sports, they're asked to do those things. If you think about things like I go back to the Pagulas and the Pagulas owning the Buffalo Buttes, but from what I hear, there was no money exchanged. To me, that doesn't seem like the best, uh, you know, leadership. You should absolutely, if you have a product that someone wants in on, they should pay for that. And then you have them pay for whatever the cost is, and then a little bit more, because you know what? Had you gotten money for the value of the franchise and then added a little bit more on that, then that could have been used to help the league across the league in other places. But if there was no money exchanged, if some of these deals are coming in and they're giving exposure to the game, that's great. But if they're not bringing money into the game, eventually that's going to peter out. And maybe that's what we saw with, with, you know, both of these leagues at certain times with deals that could have been profitable and maybe should have been profitable that weren't for one reason or another. Right. This might be a good time to talk a little bit about money again. I, I just wanted to go over some of the salary cap stuff. I mean, like the in the Canadian Women's Hockey League, there was a hundred thousand salary cap for teams and a $10,000 max salary for individuals. And just to give that context, in the men's league, there's a $700,000 salary cap for individuals, and there's a team salary cap of $83 million in this coming season. I mean, it's <laughs> just like <laughs> the difference is just mind-blowing. Yeah, the money is astronomical. You know, you can't argue that money is a part of this, but something that I love to mention that often is not mentioned when we talk about men's sports is that the cost of facilities for the MLB, for the NHL, that cost for the league or even for the team owners, is it's not absorbed by the league or the team owners. It's often absorbed by the public. These are subsidies. These are subsidies that pay for these arenas. And so... Th that, of course, is going to impact, you know, once they are able to make a revenue, if you can just take out an entire line item of millions of dollars for a state of the art facility that's going to allow you to bring in thousands more people and sell thousands more tickets and thousands more hot dogs and beers and merchandise, etc. Of course, that's going to affect your bottom line positively. But if you look what we ask women's professional sport to do, they have to pay for their facilities and they're not theirs. They're renting them. They, um, you know, are having to find ways to pay for streaming services as opposed to having deals with ESPN, CBS, you know, ABC, NBC, et cetera. The, the, the equity is, is, is just astronomical, the inequity, I should say. And, and so, of course, because of all of those things, the men are going to have more money to play with. And that's understandable. And I think if you talk to players, they're not asking right now to make millions of dollars. But to say that there's not enough money in sport, in the business of sports, to find ways to give women a living wage to pay professional sports in 2019, that argument doesn't that doesn't make sense to me. <laughs> right. 
Anya Alvarez, who has been on the podcast, recently wrote an article about how she's always mm-hmm. argued for wage equity in women's sports. And she is rethinking that. She's now thinking it should be marketing equity. And I think that's so interesting. Mm-hmm. And it relates to exactly what you were saying is that, you know, we're looking at this tiny bit of the bigger picture, whereas maybe we need to look at, at marketing and, and, you know, accept the fact there is an audience for women's sports. We're just not we're not drawing it. We're not letting people know about it. That's correct. I mean, you, you've seen that the NWHL, they put out for the first time, might I add, attendance numbers. And people who casually or not at all follow women's sports, women's hockey, they look at those numbers. Oh, my gosh, you know, average attendance, 1,000 or, you know, 700. And it's like, well, 700 average attendance is actually also their max attendance. Women are playing in facilities that only fit a certain amount and women are playing with no, you know, no access to marketing, um, or very little, uh, and, and who makes those decisions? It's certainly not the players. They would love to be, you know, have a, uh, on the bottom line of ESPN or make more appearances like Kendall coin Schofield has on, um, NHL network and all of these things. But there are gatekeepers that, at best are perpetuating the concept that women don't deserve more marketing because marketing women is not going to be uh, revenue generating. And at worst, they're doing that uh, knowingly because of, if I want to be nice about it, a a twinge of uh, the residue of sexism that still exists in in the world and it's really unfortunate but you're starting to see women in sports call that out so i go back to the WNBA calling that out and go back to u.s soccer and even the usa hockey team they're calling that out because when they are able to have larger venues when they are able to have their jerseys customized online there are fans that are showing up. The fans are online asking why they can't buy children's size WNBA jerseys or why they can't have a customized Kelly O'Hara jersey as she gets ready to play in the World Cup. Why is that even a thing? I think it's sort of hilarious. You know, the, the, the links to which people go to watch women's sports, <laughs> you know, like it's so exactly. much work to find it on TV or exactly. online or whatever. And, you know, for men's sport, you just flick it on and then the numbers are, are compared. Exactly. It's just everywhere. Yeah. It's everywhere. You don't have to think about it. Not even at all. And we're just, I think women's sports are just asking for more of that integrate sport, just like you do on the men's side. Right. What is your like big, big picture ideal of what these women's leagues look like? And use hockey, if you want, as an example of like, what would you like to see if we were starting at ground zero? Yeah, that's a great question. If we were starting at ground zero, I think that you really do need to get the federations involved. And I say federations on the women's side because, again, women's sports across the board, soccer, basketball, hockey, are consistently bringing medals to the United States and Canada. Constantly qualifying, constantly top 10, top 5, top 3 in all of those sports for the U.S., and Canada in particular, I want to, st- I'll stick to North America because sure. you could, you could bring in Brazil, you could bring in Germany, you could bring in France, you could bring in Finland, depending on the sport, but we'll start with just North America. Federations are getting exposure to their federation, Olympic teams, because of women in sports, because of the success of particularly teams. So federations, in my opinion, have an obligation to support their winningest team and allow them the resources at minimum to continue in their winning ways. Unfortunately, U.S. soccer, USA hockey have not done that. But a way that if they really wanted to, that they could right the ship 
is by supporting women's professional leagues. And that is a win-win for them. Give your players, when they're not in training camp, when they're not competing at the international level, give them somewhere to refine their skill. Give yourself a place to find the next Hillary Knight, the next Julie Chu. Give yourself an opportunity to find that talent. And it, it comes right to you. And the way that you do that is by supporting a women's professional league. That's what I would like to see. I would also like to see women at the top and at the front office in the C-suite, if you will, in these leagues. Sure. That would make a huge difference. Yeah. And, and let them be retired players. I mentioned Jaina Hefford earlier. She took over when Brenda Andress stepped down. It was a short-lived uh, stint as commissioner, but I think that players were willing to have conversations and work with Jaina Hefford is my interpretation of how players felt about Jaina Hefford. And I think there's something about knowing that there's been a player that's been there in the trenches. And honestly, particularly when Jaina played, they've probably had it worse than the current players. <laughs> right. Well, that's super exciting about the WNBA hiring Kathy Engelberg. Yes, Kathy Engelberg. So she was she played college basketball. She played at Lehigh under Muffet McGraw, mm -hmm. of course, who's now with Notre Dame. And yes, that is exciting. And she brings that business um, business sense also. So I think, again, there are models. They exist. Val Ackerman is a perfect example. She also played collegiate basketball and then became the first president of the WNBA. These former players, elite level athletes in sports business, they exist. And they, they, there are women. There are even women of color. My goodness, can you imagine? <laughs> there are even women of color in You're these positions. You're talking crazy now. <laughs> uh, right? Am I asking for too much? Should I pull back? Never. I never will. I never will. Anyway, that could be a whole nother podcast. But right. my, my point is that these, these, these women exist. Uh, these federations, I, I think, make, a, my, I would argue, make a lot of money uh, a lot of good faith and good old fashioned nationalism comes from women's sports being successful, women's teams being successful. And I think there is an obligation for federations to get involved and to give their federations the best chance to continue to be successful. And that comes from supporting women's professional leagues. And you didn't mention, you know, women's hockey league at all. Well, um, I, I think that I'm not convinced that the NHL is the best model, mostly because I don't think that they have an interest immediately. Mm -hmm. um, and I also think what's interesting is the NHL, and I'm, I'm not as familiar with the NHL, but from what I hear, a lot of people who cover the NHL very well expect that there will be another lockout. So is Gary Bettman as commissioner – is the N the NHLPA, are they really going to want to put funds towards a women's league if that's the only funder you're looking for when players of the NHL are are going to be, you know, in negotiations with, with their own league? I don't know. Like, if I were a player in the NHLPA, aside of what I think of women's hockey, if I started to see hundreds of thousands, but more realistically, millions of dollars go into something new instead of what we're asking for, that might make me feel some kind of way. Um, and so I don't know if that's something that the NHL is going to want to take on, but I could be wrong. I don't know. Well, what should we expect to, or what, what should we be looking for in the next three months to happen? Like what should we be watching for? I think we should be watching for, and I, I mentioned this a little bit earlier, are there certain players, even though they've taken the For the Game pledge, are they going to want to continue to play professional hockey and competitive team-oriented hockey elsewhere? So look for players that may be played in North America, either in the CWHL or the NWHL. Look to see if they're trying to sign contracts in Sweden, in Switzerland, in Russia. I think I'd look for that. Another thing is... We know that free agency for the NWHL has opened. Look to see if players are signing. Um, that's going to be, you know, kind of big to see. We might not know all of the names right now who 
at minimum had questions about for the game, but once they sign contracts, we'll know that they were willing to sign a North American contract. So definitely look for that. Um, I think also on the for the game front, look for players who are going to remain in North America. Look to see if they start coordinating efforts where they can engage with fans, whether that's camps. I've heard the idea of kind of like a barnstorming or exhibition style tournament, very much like I mentioned uh, the soccer team did. Cannot recommend enough that podcast 30 for 30 has up right now on that. Um, but but I've heard you know people allude to that that could be the case. Um, but my question with that is who's funding it and what are the payers going to get paid for that? Because, again, this is at the crux about knowing your your value. And so I do hope that um, if that does happen, that there are funders willing to provide the resources and the salaries for these women to continue to showcase and grow the game. And uh, before we sign off, tell us where we can find uh, your work and follow what you're writing and talking about. Yeah, for sure. So for women's hockey... I am kind of still a freelancer, but uh, I've been writing for the Hockey News. I have a few things up at The Guardian. For women's basketball, I am very excited. Uh, there'll be some news that will officially announce on Monday, so I'll save it for now. But I have a new outlet and a new exciting project for a pretty prominent sports media outlet that is going to be taking up women's basketball. So I will be doing beat writing for the Liberty for that. And awesome. then I also, yeah, I'm very excited. And then I also cover soccer. I cover all three of the main sports and then everything else in between. I will be writing for the Equalizer and a few other places for women's World Cup coverage, but also the NWSL is back in action. So I'll be doing all of that there. But if that was too much to follow, you can follow me directly at elindsay08. That's E L I N D S A Y 08 on Twitter and Instagram. And I will have links for all of that on the show notes for this podcast episode. Excellent. Great. Thank you so much. And maybe we can get you back on. Oh, I'd love that. Absolutely. Cool. Take care. Talk to you soon. Thank you. You, Bye -bye. Are, you have a good one. You Bye. too. Once again, a big, big thank you to Erica for being on the podcast. She and I spoke the day before Hashtag For The Game announced that a new women's hockey union was formed. So as you just heard, we did not discuss that. But you can find a link to some information on that, along with a ton of other links, including the 30 for 30 podcast about the 99ers women's soccer team in the show notes. Also there... Find more about Erica with links to her writing. It is super exciting that The Atlantic has really stepped up to support the WNBA this season. As viewers and women's sports fans, it's incredibly important that we show our support with dollars and viewership. Buy merch, sign up for the WNBA League Pass to watch games. It's only $16.99. And check out The Atlantic. All those links are in the show notes. And as always, thanks for listening. Have you ever wanted to know how to win a Formula One Grand Prix? I mean, really know. Know about the driver tactics from the cockpit, the strategy calls from the pit wall, and even the mind games in the paddock. There's a lot more that goes into winning a Grand Prix than just 90 minutes of racing. So every week on the F1 Strategy Report, we're taking a deep dive into the decisions that shape every result. Hey there, my name is Michael Laminato, and every week I'm joined by an expert guest from the paddock to talk through the big calls that won the race and the missteps that resulted in bitter defeat. Before every race, we'll look back at the previous year's result and consult the current form guide, and we'll be in your feed after every Grand Prix, dissecting the outcome and what it means for the championship. So for your regular hit of Formula One analysis, subscribe to the F1 Strategy Report wherever you get your favourite podcasts. The Strategy Report is a beer mogul podcast on the Evergreen Podcasts Network. My name's Michael Laminato and I'll catch you after the chequered flag.